We are going to talk about Thomas Sulo's algorithm. But first, I'd like to begin with a story, which happened several years ago when I took my daughter to the commissary on a shopping trip. Now, if you've ever been to the commissary, you've probably seen those lines that snake around the front of the registers as if paying for groceries were a ride at Disney World. But on this particular day, not only did the line zigzag in front of the registers as usual, but it also ran all the way to the corner of the store, then down the aisle toward the back, and even all the way along the refrigerated meats in the back of the store. Now, my first thought was to simply leave. I thought no groceries were going to be worth a wait like that. However, my daughter was just getting to the age when she was old enough to push a shopping cart. So I had an idea. I took my daughter to the back of the line and told her to be very careful not to hit the woman in front of her. And then I went down a couple aisles and I put some groceries in the cart. And then as she was inching along in the line, I kept going up and down the aisles grabbing groceries. And this continued all the way around the store until she was finally almost at the head of the line just as I was grabbing a carton of ice cream out of the freezer. It could not have been timed any better. Now looking back, I realized this is not unlike Thomas Sulo's algorithm. If I had been by myself, I would have had to get all the groceries in my cart first and then have to wait in line. But we were able to do an out-of-order execution, that is, we were able to start the second task, getting in line, before the first task, grocery shopping, had been complete. So let's take a look at the architecture on a chip that employs Thomas Sulo's algorithm. As on any other chip, there's an instruction queue where instructions are loaded for execution, along with some floating point registers. There are also some buffers used to buffer the load and store operations. These use address registers and an address unit that can be used to calculate address offsets. Our example is going to show how those work in a few moments. These operations are fed into a memory unit that's responsible for reading or writing the data, which hopefully more often than not happens in the chip's cache. There are also reservation stations for arithmetic operations. In this example, we have five. Each one will need to put in an operation from the instruction queue along with the associated operands from the floating point registers. Once everything is needed for the operation to occur is in the reservation station, that goes into an ALU. In this example, three of the reservation stations are going into an adder, while the other two go into a multiplier. There are actually three adders and two multiplying ALUs on this chip, one dedicated to each reservation station. However, we may be showing only one of these during much of the example. Lastly, there is a common data bus where the output from the ALU operations and the load and store operations are broadcast. As we break down a short example, you'll see how this is used. Now we're ready to work through an example. Notice how we've already put a couple integers into two of the address registers. And there is also some data in one of the floating point registers, in this case, register 4. We'll also load the next set of instructions from the instruction unit. Before we get underway, we need to state some assumptions. Load, add, and subtract operations will each take two clock cycles to complete, while multiply instructions will require 10 clock cycles to finish and divide instructions 40. Now it's important to note, these are simply assumptions. It's not like every Thomas Sulo's chip takes two clock cycles for an add and 40 for a divide. But in order to step through the example, we need to know how long an operation would take. So those are the values we've assigned to this particular example. We're also going to track when each instruction was issued and when it was finished. We're going to do this up in the top left corner in a region I might call the green table. The information on the green table is not on the chip. It's just something included here to help us keep track of what's going on. Nothing has happened yet, which is why we are at clock cycle zero. But let's advance the clock and get underway. At clock cycle 1, we are ready to execute this load instruction. The load operand is sent to the address unit, along with the address offset of 34, which is found within the instruction. The address unit reads from the address register R2 and performs the add, and the resultant value, 76, is put into the load buffer. We will color this load buffer red to show that it is busy. We'll do the same thing for floating point register F1. It's now busy because it's awaiting the value from the cache. 
By the way, how do we know the data is in the cache? That's because of our assumption that a load only takes two clock cycles. Were this a cache miss, the operand would probably take 200,000 clock cycles, but I don't think you want to watch a video that long. Good thing that data is in the cache already. Clock cycle 2 is another load operation. This works pretty much the same way as the previous instruction, with the load command being put into the address unit, along with the offset in the command, which is 45, and the address in the register, which coincidentally is also 45. That address is then calculated and it's put into another load buffer, which is marked busy. And we'll also mark the destination register, F2, as busy, the same way we did before. Now things really start to get interesting in clock cycle 3. Sure, we're about to issue the multiply command, but first it's worth pointing out that it's been two clock cycles since that first load command was issued, so that's about to finish up. Let's look at it first. The data has been retrieved from memory, and now the common data bus lights up as the resulting piece of data is broadcast to any subscribers who are waiting for it. In this case, that's the destination register, F1. But before we rest on our laurels too much, we still have a multiplication instruction that needs to be executed. So first the operation comes down the operations bus to one of the multiplication reservation stations, which, if you've noticed, has been marked as busy. The first operand, coming from F4, is ready to load. It's been ready since the beginning of this example. However, the second operand, F2, is not yet ready because the register is still in a busy state. And that's exactly what we would expect to happen. We can't multiply by a number that hasn't been loaded yet. But it's worth noting that we're able to start making progress on this command even before the previous command was finished. Remember, that's the essence of the algorithm. In any case, we are going to use this load F2 notation to represent the fact that this command won't be ready to execute until the value is retrieved from memory. And the one other thing we'll need to do here is make sure the destination register, F3, is also marked busy. Now let me back up just one clock cycle and emphasize an, an important point. Everything that occurs in clock cycle 3 happens more concurrently than I've depicted it here. So far, I've been showing this as a series of events. The completion of the load, the fetching of the next instruction, the filling of the reservation station. I've been showing this as if it's done serially. But in fact, a lot of this is happening all at once. So it would really look more like this. However, when I depict it that way, it's a lot harder to follow everything that's going on, so we're going to press forward by dissecting things a little bit more piece by piece, the way we have been. So now let's advance to clock cycle 4. Remember that second load instruction that was issued in clock cycle 2? Well, it's had enough time to fetch the value from the cache, and that value is now ready to be put into register F2. However, something else very interesting is going on here. That value is not only being written to the register, because the register is not the only subscriber to the information. We need this same value as an operand in the reservation station. And this illustrates the advantage of the common data bus. We won't need to wait one additional clock cycle for the operand to move from the register into the reservation station. The reservation station can get this value directly from the memory unit via the common data bus. So let's put it in there. But this isn't the only thing happening in clock cycle 4. We also have a subtraction command to take care of. This will work much like the multiply operation did, with the operand coming down the operand bus, although this time we're using one of the three adding reservation stations. We can also load the first operand from F1. However, the second operand, F2, presents an interesting discussion point. While the multiply reservation station was already subscribed to F2 at the start of this clock cycle, this reservation station was not. So it comes down to this. Can this reservation station get subscribed in time to accept F2 directly from the common data bus? 
Well, that's an issue that the chip designers would have to contend with, but it's not really pertinent to how the algorithm works as a whole. So we're just going to assume that this reservation station is unable to get subscribed in time, and we'll have to load this information via the operand bus in the next clock cycle. There's one more thing we need to take care of before we finish. We need to mark the designation register F5 as busy. No upcoming instruction using F5 should be able to execute until the result of this subtraction has been written into the register. In clock cycle 5, we have some minor housekeeping to do. Now that F2 has been written, it's no longer busy, so let's not color that red anymore. Moreover, because it's no longer busy, we can update the reservation station with the operand. Now both of these instructions are ready to go. The data is moved from the reservation stations into their corresponding ALUs, and the multiply and subtraction operations both commence. Let's add a column in the green table showing when these operations got started. We were already tracking when they were issued. Notice how, much like my daughter and I working in tandem at the commissary, the subtraction operation didn't have to wait for the multiplication operation to finish before it got underway. This is because the chip has more than one ALU, along with the necessary reservation stations that allow instructions to hold their place while waiting for the operands to become available. Now we still have a divide operation to take care of. Because we're still in the same clock cycle when the first reservation station kicked off the multiply, it's not free yet, so we'll have to use the second reservation station for this operation. Had there only been one reservation station available, we would stall, but because there is more than one, we keep pressing on. The division operator comes down the operation bus while one of the two operands, F1, does the same. By looking at our program, we can see that we'll have to wait on F3 until the multiply operation is complete, and since it just got started, that'll be 10 clock cycles before the operand is available but we'll be ready to go after that result is broadcast over the common data bus. Finally, the last thing we'll do here is change the status of F2. F2 is the data it was waiting for, so as said before, it's no longer busy. And here at the beginning of the next clock cycle, clock cycle 6, those reservation stations are freed up as well. Our next instruction is an add instruction, and we'll see that this works much like the previous arithmetic instructions. However, this is the first time we show a reservation station being used a second time. It's no longer busy, so we can use it. Once again, only one of the two operands is currently available. However, you can see what's going to happen here. We now have two instructions waiting for an operand in the reservation stations, but which one will be ready to execute first? That's right, the addition. Because F5, the result of a subtraction operation, is going to be ready long before F3, the result of a multiplication operation. So this will allow us to do an out-of-order execution. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's go to clock cycle 7. There are no more instructions in the instruction queue. However, we started a subtraction operation in clock cycle 5, a mere two cycles ago, and this operation only takes two clock cycles to complete. Therefore, the result is coming out of the adder now and being broadcast onto the common data bus. From there, it will be written in two places, namely the two subscribers, F5 and this reservation station. This means this add operation will be able to start executing on the next clock cycle which is significant because the add instruction actually comes after the division instruction in the program. Without Thomas Sulo's algorithm, we would have executed these statements sequentially. Considering that we have about eight more clock cycles for that multiply instruction to finish and then 40 more to do the divide operation, we would have been waiting for nearly 50 clock cycles to perform this add. Instead, it's going to be kicked off in clock cycle eight right after the end of this video. And that's not even taking into account the fact that we were able to start the subtraction operation at the same time as the multiply operation. So now you've seen how the algorithm works. It's not unlike having someone get in line for you at the store while you're picking up shampoo, tomato soup, paper towels, and whatever other items you'll need for the week.